Okay. So I'm going to go over some of the theory. For those of you that did do 2602, either part-time or full-time, you'll recognize a lot of the notes are very similar. And there's just things that have now been added to it. So you have got the solutions, so please don't look at the solutions. I'd prefer that you actually pay attention to what I'm doing rather than copying and everything. If you don't have a copy of the solutions, I will provide you with one and everything will be uploaded on the paper as well. So you will have access to everything. Okay. So we're doing a bit of an introduction. Um, just knowledge-wise, guys, do any of you remember anything about NPV? A little bit. A lot. Okay. I'm then going based on the fact that you guys know nothing, and I'm doing 2602 and 3702 all together. Okay, so we're doing capital budgeting. Capital budgeting, and I'm going to go over next week um, just how everything in the syllabus ties up together, but today I'm just going to focus on the number crunching stuff. So your capital budgeting is investment decisions. What am I doing? Which projects am I choosing? Can I do more than one? And how am I making those decisions? So there's different options to make those decisions. So I just want to start going through this. It's the analysis and evaluation of investment projects, which normally produce benefits over a number of years. The overall objective of capital budgeting decision is the maximization of shareholder wealth. Okay. So when we do our risk assessment and all the introduction and everything to this subject, which we're going to do in about probably three weeks' time, we learn that you know it's no longer just shareholder wealth. We need to also um, you know, have that triple bottom line. We need to worry about the economy, about the people we're affecting, our, the land that we're working on and stuff like that. But when you're doing investment of projects and which one you're going to choose, the only thing that matters is are we actually getting the return we need to. Your qualitative factors are what you're going to have as a discussion point, but the actual end result, the NPV and stuff like that that you're looking at is how much money am I making, essentially, because you want to make sure that your shareholders are getting their money. Okay. So there's different types of measurements that you can look at. The main one, guys, and you will get it asked in your exam. If it's not, I'll be very surprised, but they've asked in every single paper, and it's probably worth 20 marks minimum. If not more, it can probably be 30, 40, depending on how they ask it. That is your NPV. It was uh, big in second year. It's going to be big this year, and they focus on it a lot. Okay. We do go over all the methods. Okay. So there's a large number of areas where capital budget budgeting decisions may be made. Um, traditionally, two, we need to either replace our existing machinery or we're going to have a new acquisition because we're going to do a new project. So that's the main things that you're going to be dealing with. There are other options like, you know, uh, I'm trying to think now and I can't. I've had it. I will get there, guys. But those are the two main ones. You need to understand the key concepts and the terminology. If you don't understand this, it's going to be very difficult to do your cash flow. So your key concepts here is an independent project. Is the acceptance or rejection of one project has no bearing or influence on the acceptance of another project. So two very separate projects. Like auditing, you're independent. There's no um, relationship between the two. You can do A or B, or you can do A and B. You don't have to accept one to accept the other. Kay. Your mutually exclusive projects are projects where only one or of several alternatives may be chosen at a time. The acceptance of one immediately leads to the rejection of the others. So you can only do one or the other. Your capital rationing refers to the situation where an enterprise is unable to initiate all available apparently viable projects because of limited funds. Guys, you're never going to be able to go to the bank and say, I've got these 20 projects which I want to run, all feasible, all make money, and they're going to say, okay, cool, we're going to fin finance every single one of them. They'll finance one or two, they're not going to fund the entire thing, and neither are the shareholders. It's a lot of risk to take to put so much money into running so many different projects. So chances are you're going to choose one of the projects or maybe two. Your divisible projects are projects where the whole project or any fraction thereof may be in initiated. In other words, a project can be reduced or increased in size or broken into smaller projects. So if you look at some tender documents, for those of you guys that have seen tenders, um, you'll be looking at it and they'll say, okay, there's part A, part B, part C. You can apply for all of them, but you may not be awarded all of them. So you may be awarded all three, but you can do A and B, but not C. Okay. So there may be differences, so there may be a, a finance part of things and a legal side of things, and you might get awarded the finance part. And then your indivisible projects are those where the whole project must be undertaken its entirety or not at all. So we're doing everything. There's different parts to it, and we need to do every single part. Yeah. Guys, this is straight from 2602. There's nothing new there. Your relevant cash flows, and as well, nothing's changed here from 2602. 
I'm going to go through this in detail because I'm going to give you guys an example which I want you to do. So it's a quite a detailed example, that Mendo's example. And it's probably going to take you over 30 minutes to do, but I'm going to give you about 30 minutes just for time constraint. And it's an NPV calc which takes into account all of this which I'm going through. Yeah. So your relevant cash flows are in and outflows that arise in the future. Guys, and keyword here is the future as a result of a decision made. Which means if I yesterday went out and I did research and development, is that the future? It's the past. So whatever happened, whether it was two hours ago, before I made my decision to take on a project, it was a future cash flow, which means it's no re not relevant. So that's what we actually call a sunk cost. So if I had research and development into one of the projects and it cost me 100,000 Rand, I don't include it in my cash flow because it already happened. But if during my cash flow or during my project, I'm going to have marketing because I need to advertise my product, that is a cash flow item. Okay. So it needs to be a future, um, arises in the future. Only relevant cash flows are taken into account when we do cash flow budgeting. So your examples of this is the cost of a machine. I have a project, I need a new machine, I need to buy my machine. So there's a capital outlay there. The proceeds from the sale of the asset at the end of its useful life, you guys know at the end of three years, you normally will sell this because you no longer need this machine. The investment in the working capital. So guys, this one I think people get a bit confused with. Working capital, who knows what that is? No one. Okay. So your working capital and your working capital cycle is your debtors, creditors, and inventory days. So the combination of me going to my supplier today saying, I'm starting a project, I need stock. They give me stock on credit, I now have my inventory. Inventory stays on hand for how long? And then I sell it, and that's my debtors. So there's a cycle there that happens. None of it I'm paying physical cash, because in the real world, everything buys on credit. There's no way you're going to walk into your supplier and say, I need this for my project. It's going to cost two million, here's two million cash. It's going to be on credit. And the same when they're buying from you, your debtors, they're buying on credit. So there's a time delay, essentially, of when you're going to get that money from your debtors. So you're going to have to outlay the capital for your stock and everything first, and then your debtors are only going to pay you 30, 60 days later. So with this, every month or two months, the cycle is going to repeat. So you're not going to go and put in your cash flow every two months, in, out, in, out, in, out. So the net effect is on day zero or day one, that money is out. And on the last day of the project, all that money comes back in. Okay, so it's an outflow in day one and an inflow on the last day of the project. Okay, and that is two very easy marks that you'll get, guys. You're literally slotting in things. Your cash sales, so obviously your, um, your revenue that you're going to have payments of variable costs, and any additional fixed costs. So when they say additional fixed costs, um, I'm going to use Edge for an example. So Edge wants to start running the FEMA program. How are we going to do that? We're just going to use our own offices. So when I'm doing my cash flows and my projections, am I going to include the rental for my office? Okay, it's already happened. Whether I start it or not, I'm going to have to pay the rent for these premises. However, if I don't have enough room and I need to go and rent additional space, that's my additional fixed cost. Or an additional employee to go and lecture those modules and everything. So those are the additional fixed costs they're talking about, not your existing costs that are already there whether you accept the project or not. Not going too fast? Everyone with me? Okay. Then you get your non-cash flow items. So when we're doing NPV, we're doing cash flow. So anything non-cash like your depreciation and your bad debts and everything, you need to exclude. So if they give you an amount saying your expenses are 10,000 Rand and this includes depreciation, you have to add back depreciation. Okay. Your non-relevant cash flows, so this is not included in your capital budgeting calculations. So like I said, your fixed rental and stuff like that. Any fixed costs are not included. Your working capital, so there's additional inventory to support the new business, and this is what I was saying, so it's obviously it's going into more detail. In outflow in um, year one and inflow in the last year of your project. Then your sunk cost, anything that happened before the decision was made to do that investment or to do the cash flow of the investment. Okay. So any research and development, any patent fees, anything like that that happened previous to today, all of that is a sunk cost. Very important, guys, when you're doing your exams, you don't just leave it out and ignore it. So MAT 2602, you just left it. Now, 3702, you need to put it in, you need to put zero, and you need to say it's a sunk cost. So same as you do in tax, where you say something that's like VAT and, um, is zero rated and you put zero, you need to do the same now for MAT. 